This is the DLR Cast, the essential podcast for fans of Diamond David Lee Roth. All right, here we are once again back at the DLR Cast. I'm Steve, along with my good friend Darren. We're two fans, but not fanboys, of the great <laughs> Diamond David Lee Roth. Hey, Darren, great to see and talk to you again. Great to see you. Great to connect. Great to be doing this. Just a lot of greatness on this. A, this a lot of greatness. And we got some news here, some Dave news, and we've got an, yet another Darren Solo interview, which we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about in a second. But first, let's talk. Let's say hello to some friends of ours around the world here, especially in Australia and Finland, where thanks to PodStatus.com, you and I found out this week that we are number 21 in Australia in the category of music commentary and number 150 in the category of music in australia number 24 in the category of music commentary in finland oh and let's not forget 134 in music commentary in canada and dare i say here we are we're in the top 130 number 129 in the category of music com music commentary in the united states so thank you for our burgeoning success here at the DLR cast folks around the world. <laughs> if there's any doubt ever in anyone's mind, whether we were the number one David Lee Roth podcast in the world, I think there's your answer. We are number one with a bullet. You know, I, I'm going to say maybe we're the number one David Lee Roth podcast of all time, not just mm -hmm. in the world of all time. I'm going to say not we might be the number one Van Halen podcast uh, of all time. Uh, the number one music podcast of all time, certainly. <laughs> all right. Now I think we're taking some major, <laughs> major leaps here. Uh, yes. So I don't want to get I don't want to get too crazy here. But it's great. It is great to know, though, that we've got we uh, we're certainly enjoying this. And it seems like people are because our downloads and our streams are increasing every single week. And we're getting we're getting people from uh from around the world. Most of folks are coming from the US, but we've got folk we've got fans in of course the aforementioned Finland, Australia, but also a good number of folks from Canada, the United Kingdom, the UK, and uh, uh, Germany as well. I'm looking here. So Norway, France, Spain. So hello. I wish I could say hello in more than just a couple languages. Hola, but anyway, it's great to have it's great to uh, it's great to have all you folks here and dig in what we're digging. I mean, didn't you learn more Spanish from listening to Sonrisa Salvaje? This might be a record because this is the <laughs> you this is this might be the quickest you have ever ever brought up the Spanish language version of Eden and Smile on one of our podcasts, Darren. Well, so well, kudos to you. <laughs> thank you. I mean, it's the number one ranked DLR podcast in the world and the fastest mention of some reason to stop. Hey, we we like to break records and that's what we do for all you out there. We we try. We try. Well, we hope you're having if you're having half as much fun as we are on this, we'll consider it a success. So but we do have some Dave news here. A couple things just hitting the wire. Uh, first off. There's a new Music Cares auction. The charity Music Cares auction features items from Pete Townsend, Brian May, Madonna, and, of course, Diamond David Lee Roth. So there's a new uh, Music Cares charity relief auction, which will raise money for those in the music industry affected by COVID-19. It's set to launch January 31st. And Dave has put up the very cool black jacket that's embroidered with rhinestones the black it's a black with kind of that gold and yellow uh, uh design some people call it a bolero jacket a blazer i personally loved it this is what he wore on their 2000 the van halen 2007 2008 reunion tour so that's part of the auction there's no details here as far as what the minimum bid is or the reserve price but i'm pretty well sure that i will not be able to afford to bid uh i will not be able to afford to put in a bid but i think it's kind of cool that he's doing that nevertheless these rock auctions it's always an inverse thing where the things that you think are going to be the most expensive are not and vice versa i went to this ronnie james dio auction <laughs> two years ago or three years ago and just like what i'm saying you think that oh um people are going to want that rug from his studio they're really going to want the Dio rug from his studio. And then that was one of the lower items. I thought, oh, people are going to want the couch from his studio. And they didn't want that. And then I said, OK, well, no one's going to want these road cases. And then I bid on, on the road cases and they were more expensive. 
you know, <laughs> I thought they would be like a nice coffee table kind of thing. It looked like one of the road cases belonged Dio and the Beach Boys at different times. But uh, bottom line is these auctions are a lot of fun, even if you have no plans to bid on anything. And Music Cares is a great cause, and they still work with top artists all these years later. Yeah, they're a great charity, and the cause is fantastic. Obviously, the entire music industry, particularly the live performance industry, has just been uh, just decimated by COVID-19. The fact that nobody's been out on the road for the better almost a year now. So all for a good cause, and I've always thought that jacket is cool, and we'll have to keep an eye and see what else uh, down the road maybe Dave will be donating. Perhaps some original artwork, which, of course, just very recently – he, yeah. a couple days ago, earlier this week, back uh, January 18th or so, as a matter of fact, he put up yet another new piece of original artwork, and it was inspired by, of what it seems to be inspired by, the uh, US, the riot at the Capitol earlier this month. And, of course, there's been – it seems like every other week, every two weeks or so, he had an interesting – painting about the vaccinations, the COVID-19 vaccinations. And again, we always talk about this, love the fact that he is continue to be so creative, but you might remember this because we just had him on not, uh, not too long ago. But if I remember correctly, a recent guest, as a matter of fact, and that, uh, sorry, Richard Hilton, the keyboardist from Your Filthy yeah. Little Mouth, who was back on episode 20, said that the lyric sheets – that Dave was using with the lyrics were had all these handwritten illustrations. A lot of them you saw in the CD booklet, the album uh, jacket artwork for your filthy little mouth. So it's not, it's not big news. I don't think it's new news to a lot of folks that Dave has always been very artistic, but it's just, it goes back a long way now. It's pretty cool to see. And I remember getting, getting, uh, a different kind of truth and opening that CD book and seeing all those cool pictures and just went, all right, I dig his artwork. Yeah. I can't think of what it is. If it's an insurance thing where, you know, the person has to take a photo with that day's newspaper to prove that they were alive and well, uh, that particular day, like a timestamp. <laughs> and I kind of think with Dave talking about the White House insur- insurrection kind of situation and him talking about COVID-19 and all that, you're going, OK, so he is alive and well, because, you know, there's no David Lee Roth sightings anywhere. There's no regular social media. So you, sometimes, yeah, you got to go like, is he OK? Where does he live? Uh, I got well, a tip off from a, a great comment that we got on YouTube about a recent episode where somebody said that Dave is living overseas right now. I don't know if that's true. Yeah. I, who knows? I would have guessed he was in Pasadena because that's where back in the summertime, we saw some press that was done in the summertime about the painting, the CBS this morning thing, the, the uh, new, it was a New York times article. I think it was. And it just dawned on me. And Dave's like, what, 67 years old. You're in the high risk category for COVID buddy. Uh, there's probably no cooler place or no cooler person to quarantine with <laughs> than, than David Lee Roth, particularly in that cool house in Pasadena. So I would imagine him keep him keeping a low profile is not just artistic inspiration, but also, preparation and uh, and being smart about covid as he was calling it before covid for the then upcoming vegas residency and all that he was calling it all cross training you know the singing the dancing the exercising it's cross training so yes my money would be that dave is cross training for something in general whatever that is we have no idea there's no unfortunately no kitchen sink tour but he's cross training for something Indeed, indeed. And I think the bottom line with Dave, it's it's the it's kind of the Boy Scouts MO and that is be prepared. Right. We we saw this in recent news with an interview that Brian Young did recently. Brian Young being Dave's guitar player in the early aughts in his solo band where he just said he's the boss. He he had a great time. But you here's where the direction comes from. You know exactly what you need to do. And he was a really hard guy to work for sometimes, but it paid off. Yeah, I was thinking about this the other day. I saw four shows with Brian Young. I saw one in 03 on Long Island here at Westbury Music Fair, the infamous theater in the round uh, venue that's probably come up on an interview or two. I saw him in Japan in 2004, 
in Milwaukee at Summerfest. Like I just so happened to be at these places when those things were happening. And then in 06, I saw him in New York City at the PlayStation Theater, which had a, a ton of different names. So I saw Brian Young four times in action. All four times there was a second guitarist on there as well. I think his name is Toshi Higeta, who hopefully we can eventually get on the podcast. But I always thought that Brian Young was part of the last great David Lee Roth band. And by that, I've talked your ear off off mic about this uh 2003 Mean Street TV performance. Did you check that out? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That is just smoking. Yeah. That is a killer performance. Yeah, everyone in the band looks super cool. Ray Luzier is just killing it on drums. My favorite part, not to spoil anything, I, you just to find this on YouTube, you put in Brian Young, Mean Street. And in some TV show, I can't tell if that's maybe Carson Daly, like an early iteration of his show. I mean, there's no TV show that I remember looking like that, but that's clearly like a TV audience. Do you have any idea what that is? No, it sounds vaguely familiar. I I don't know what it is, but I'm pretty sure it's 2003. They're doing Mean Street with the DLR band at that point. My favorite part is right before uh, this is oh this is Mean Street. He you see the guitarist has to go to one side, the bassist has to go to the other side because there's a karate kick coming. In other words, it's choreographed to the point that everyone knows we need to get away with Dave, get away from Dave, or we're gonna get karate kicked in the face right now. <laughs> like, you can see the Red Seas part on that. <laughs> but he doesn't deep breathe nothing. He hits the lyric, he hits the karate kick, and he hits his um how do you call that? Wow. Like how do you <laughs> What wow. the, that thing? <laughs> the Yelp? I'm going to try it right now. It's been a long day. Like, so he's super shredded and singing awesome and moving amazing in that period. And I never was able to figure out, like, how is he still doing that in 04, 05? And then in the 07, 08 Van Halen reunion, suddenly he was talking the songs a little there was bit. more there was more there was less acrobatics more shaking and shimmying a little bit more yeah i that was one of the things that surprised me and i don't want to say disappointed me because i was so excited to see that reunion tour and i thought especially 0708 dave yeah. sounded great certainly the whole band was incredible with wolfie but i not that i expect him to do a gigantic 12 foot leap off a drum riser like 83 84 time period or <laughs> even 86 and eat him and smile but there was a little bit less kicks a little bit, and then increasingly it just there was what was it the uh, the different guy of truth tour we had an actual dr uh, dance floor onto the uh, wooden dance yeah. floor on the stage there and doing a lot of that stuff and i i think that was just compensated for the fact that at some point hip pointer surgery i don't know what it is i mean I, I, listen i'm 53 i i don't have i don't have the <laughs> flexibility he does at age 66 67 now so i get it but yeah right around that time that was kind of the end the early aughts where it was like yeah he's still getting the kicks there but that was kind of the end of it yeah there's there's two theories that i i could just come up with one is that he either had a back or a knee surgery we we don't know about. And, you know, why do we have to know about that? That's private. That's health. The HIPAA Act. Uh, <laughs> and, all. and then the other one is he was just doing the 03, 04, 05 touring at such a high level to kind of go, hey, Van Halens, you need me back. And then they got him back and he went, ah, I don't have to do that crap anymore. <laughs> I don't I don't know, know about that. But I think when you think of it, too, at some point, and don't get ticked at me for saying this, but at some point, I think you just have to evolve and go, yeah, I'm 60 years old or something. Even if I let's assume I can do those kicks. Yeah. I don't want to be that guy doing those kicks. At some point, you don't. you have to evolve a little bit. I don't think you necessarily want to become a parody. I'm not saying anybody's becoming a parody, but it's a little bit different when you're not wearing full scale makeup and doing the whole bit. In other words, you can be 60 something years old and be relatively slow with 30 pounds of 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 armor and gigantic boots like kiss right yeah but you're wearing all that stuff that's part of the whole 
ensemble, right? Whereas when you're up there, whether I mean, look who's evolved fantastically through the Mick Jagger, right? Yeah. I mean, he's still Mick Jagger. I mean, but you can say there's some sort of grace, I think, to that aging and evolution. And at some point, right around 03 and 04, that, that was it's like, all right, the long platinum hair, mm, the jumpsuit, yeah, okay, that was it. That's I mean, that's why that's why I you listen, I'm very much about aesthetics. I love the visual. My favorite bands have always been huge and visually interesting. And that was a big portion of Van Halen and the crazy shit that Dave wore. And one of the things that I loved about that reunion tour as far as Dave's look was was that he did look cool. It did look kind of. Oh, Christ. I don't want to say age appropriate, but I just did. You know what I mean? That Bolero jacket was really cool and you yeah. know from years where you could see what somebody's wearing and go from pictures and go oh yeah that was that tour right yeah you you definitely can do that to his credit to their credit the the look of dave has evolved in the best of ways but when he sets the bar so high right uh, and you think of like the 81 oakland footage and you think about the awesomeness of the skyscraper footage that's online that's not official, but there's still plenty of it out there that looks like it was edited. And right. he's still really awesome in the early 90s, the Little Ain't Enough video that came on randomly uh, to me on YouTube yesterday. And that's just one of the greatest music videos that no one ever talks about. There's right, which, I, which wasn't that banned from MTV at some point because of the blackface um, I I would say the blackface is just like one of the four issues from that. <laughs> <laughs> the blackface part, then the little people um part, I would say maybe is a problem. There might be some ethnic insensitivity. <laughs> but you know what? You know what disappointed me about that video and the videos from that record is that it was just Dave. There was no band. Oh, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're right about that. And even though at that point, Jason Becker's gone and the band is primarily kind of faceless with the exception of did Greg Bissonette and Matt Bissonette play on the Little Ain't Enough? Jeez, oh, who played? No, Matt Bissonette did not play drums on the Little Ain't Enough tour. It was Todd Jensen, I think. I believe it was Todd Jensen. I think and Gr Matt Bissonette Greg had moved. I think Greg played on played drums on on a little ain't enough, but then wasn't on the tour. We'll have to go back. Someone will correct <laughs> us, and feel free to correct us at Twitter at yeah. the DLR Cast or comment on your favorite podcast provider's uh, comments under the episode there, and we'll get to comments in a second. But yeah, the whole thing with the look is is that. It's funny because I was just thinking back. I mean, Edom and Smile was like, man, that spandex. I remember thinking at the time, it's like, that spandex is just insanity. I mean, <laughs> what the hell? I mean, this is just some – if you look at that – if you look at that, the video for – the video for Yankee Rose and all the and and yeah. I don't know for me it was just always I love the visual aspect of it and that went also as well for the you know the rest of the guys in his band I mean I thought Sheehan and Vi they looked cool I remember wanted looking all over the place for a pair of those wraparound sunglasses that Greg Bissonette wore I shit you not 1986 I was looking for those wraparound sunglasses man because I saw him in the beginning of that video standing up on his drum stool banging away with the, with that mullet which I kind of had at the time and those sunglasses I'm like I have to find those sunglasses that drummer is the coolest drummer I've ever seen but but back to Brian Young I think we were also talking about this off mic I think he's the longest tenured member of David Lee Roth's band ever, except for Greg Bissonette, like, or Brett Tuggle coming in and out of the picture a few times. Because right. Brett Tuggle was, he was in the live Eat em and Smile band, but not on the album, I think. The, the, the keyboards on Eat em and Smile were a combination of Jeff Bova and, um, and Jesse Harms. Right. And then I'm pretty sure that Brett Tuggle was like, the offstage keyboardist that they brought on the end of the show, but he was on stage the whole Skyscraper tour. Right, because Skyscraper had a lot more keyboards. I mean, Eat and Smile had very little keyboards on it. Very little. So I think that Brian Young is the second longest tenured member of Dave's band because he had, he said in that interview, six years. I don't know if it was, he was just yesing it or they did the math, but I know he was there in 03, 04, 05, 06. He was on the Howard Stern replacement show, like in the in-studio band playing in and out of concerts. And that was 06. I don't know if that was into 07. So 
the longest running guitar player that Dave had. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I mean, Young basically said uh, that being in the band with Dave toughened him up, made him prepared for just about anything. He expe- Dave expects a lot, as we know. He's very demanding. He's a perfectionist, perfectionist, but not just for the guys in the band, but also for himself. So it's a really high bar, and we've known this from – from reading so many interviews through the year, but it was, through the years, but it was pretty cool to to hear to Brian uh, Brian Young mention that. We should mention where he said it was on a podcast, a cool podcast called Rock and Roll Icons with Bodie James. So what Brian Young was on. So we have one other piece of news, and that is somewhat new that I saw recently, and that is that is Tesla bassist Brian Wheat mm-hmm. said that David Lee Roth wanted to manage. Tesla. And uh, we just recently put out a book called Son of a Milkman, My Crazy Life with Tesla, which just came out last month in December. And on a recent uh, recent radio interview in Canada, he was asked what David was like on the road. And Brian said, well, he's always in David mode, to be quite honest with you. I only spoke to him one time the whole tour. We walked in a room and it was all David mode. And it was all that whole, hey, it's Dave TV. Yeah, he was like that. That was my take on him. But like I said, I only got to spoke to him one time and he wanted to manage Tesla. Talk about coming out of fucking left field. He was just like, hey, I really like you guys. I really want to manage you. We were like, whoa, okay. Well, we've got this management company, Q Prime. You've heard of them? <laughs> so, I yeah. mean, and that reminds me because the very first time I had I heard who Tesla was. I heard Modern Day Cowboy on the radio. Mm-hmm. But the first time I saw Tesla live was opening up for David Lee Roth on a medium and smile tour in New York at Nassau Coliseum. And I could be wrong, but for some reason, I remember that sticks in my head at this time that that was mainly only like the seventh or eighth, maybe 10th date that Tesla had been on the road with Dave. And none of my friends who knew they who knew who they were. And I'm like, we've got to get there in time to see Tesla. And that started a love affair with Tesla I've had ever since. But the moment you heard that opening riff of modern day cowboy, I'm like, these guys are the real deal. But I it doesn't surprise me that 86 on the meet him and smile tour that Dave is going to be in Dave TV mode. Yeah. I've heard many, many stories over the years of artists managing other artists. I remember for a while rivers Cuomo from Weezer was managing a band or two. And you can't think that he's really (laughs) managing. It's more like your name goes on the thing, but then you have the day to day guy who's actually doing the correspondence and, actually handling the conference calls and actually dealing with the label, but it probably would have opened up certain doors to a lot of people to go, Hey, have you met our manager, Dave? You know, (laughs) that probably would have gotten them some good tours. Maybe Tesla would have changed from Geffen to Warner brothers as a result. Maybe Ted Templeman would have done the next Tesla album, but who knows? Who knows? I just, I, it's interesting. I don't, I don't know if, uh, would Dave have the attention span of, I don't, like you mentioned, I don't think he, I don't know if he could be a full on drop everything, pick up the phone for your client sort of manager all the time. Right. I don't, that's maybe, that's what assistants are for, I guess. Well, John Bon Jovi has managed people before. I don't know if you've ever heard the stories about how he wound up basically with more points on the, the first Skid Row record than, <laughs> than anybody. Yeah, I mean, Sebastian Bach had, I think, no points on that album because he was a hired gun that wasn't under the record deal. And that was a point of resentment for him because John Bon Jovi made more money on Skid Row than he did, and he was not Skid Row. So I think that there, at the time, maybe that was uh, Dave having a case of Gene Simmons-itis where, you know, Gene was managing and producing and he added Simmons Records through RCA. Yeah. Might have been that. I mean... Kiss learned a lot from Van Halen and then Van Halen learned a lot from Kiss. Like that cycle kind of went both ways. Although I got to tell you, even if it's just a fleeting thought, I would, if I was in those shoes, I would be like, holy shit, David Lee Roth is interested in managing us. I mean, that means he's seen something. I mean, that doesn't seem like the sort of thing where you just like pop out and go, you just, that's, it doesn't seem to me David, of all the things Dave could say to the bass player of an opening act, yeah, that would seem to be like pretty low on the list that you're just going to blur it out. Hey, I'd like to I, uh, I really want to manage you. I mean, that's coming from a place of some thought, even if obviously it was never followed up on. And the fact that we spent eight and a half minutes talking about this might be 
<laughs> might be a minute and a half too long, but it's just interesting. I mean, this is why we do this podcast, right? We're curious about what makes this crazy guy tick a lot. So, And there's a chance we might have Brian Wheat on this podcast in the coming months. That has been uh, discussed. So if that happens, maybe we'll get him to expound a little bit on the Eat em and Smile tour, because let's face it, how many people were really – uh, on that tour, around that tour, and remember it. They were sober enough to remember it. Well, and not under an NDA. <laughs> the whole thing is, I mean, I'm pretty sure Tesla opened the whole U.S. run yeah. on that tour. I think, right? And I mean, they were. You saw them on MTV. Maybe you got heard them on the radio a bit. Remember this, 1986. And Tesla was one of those bands to me that were wrongly lumped into that whole hair band thing that they couldn't they were like a hard rock black crows in my mind they were a classic they were a hard edge classic rock band i loved them from the first album i've loved them for all this many years i their live show is amazing and certainly when i saw them that first time with dave there's no makeup they're in jeans they're kicking ass and they're they're five guys from sacramento california for god's sakes playing loud rock and roll they were the perfect opener for dave so i there's uh, let's i who knows if they would have hit those heights without opening for dave because that that tour was eighteen thousand sold out seats in every freaking venue and here's a band that just had their record come out and all of a sudden you're in front of all those people night after night i mean talk about a boost to your career man talk about a great way to start it out and then from there, they found their way into the Def Leppard realm. And mm -hmm. Actually, I saw them later on the Hysteria Tour, I think it was, yeah. Uh, they kept such a long-term relationship going that I think Phil Collin produced the last Tesla album or the one before that. He did the last. The last later. <laughs> What's that? 30 years later. I mean, yeah, the, in such yeah, a they put out a record business, who sticks around in a working friendship for 30 years? So I think that speaks to the fact that if, Tesla was good enough to open for Dave in the period where he didn't want to be thought of as the Van Halen guy. And ultimately, Def Leppard was probably the biggest rock band in the U.S. for a couple of years. The number two album on the on the Billboard charts behind Thriller. I, I think that the Tesla guys, there's a reason people kept them around. And it's not just the great songs. Well, and they also put they also brought people. They also they also brought people brought people to their seats they brought people into the arena i mean they yeah. as they very quickly became that band i don't know who's opening up to oh my god we can't miss the opening act right yeah. i mean uh, odds are good if you saw def leppard in that time frame you really you also dug tesla you knew who they were so exactly so hopefully we'll get a little more truth out of brian and weed and should 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 we talk about uh this week's uh feature situation? yeah Steve brown Let's yeah, let's get to the, let's get to this interview and then we'll get to the interview. <laughs> let's get to talking about the interview and we'll get to the interview. A little context on this one is this was taped before Eddie passed, before anyone had any inkling that he was sick. I was speaking to Steve about a then new album by his band called Tokyo Motor Fist, which is some of his bandmates from Danger Danger. I mean, let's let's go down the list of everyone Steve has played with because he's not just the guy from Trickster. He's not just the guy from Tokyo Motor Fist. He's not just playing in Danger Danger. Uh, he is the on-call guitarist for Def Leppard when Phil or Vivian, you know, can't make it. So he knows both their parts. <laughs> That's pretty amazing because he filled in for Vivian when Vivian was sick. And I think did Phil have some other uh, – he, yeah, he filled in for both of them at separate times, which is uh, incredible. Yeah, he played with Dennis DeYoung. He played with a lot of the Trans-Siberian Orchestra people. I'm not sure if he played on a thing with Chris Jericho lately uh, or recently, or if that was PJ from Trickster. But the key is Steve is just one of those guys who never stopped working, who you can't just identify him as one thing or, or doing one thing. So when I was talking with him, I want to ask him about this kind of infamous video from 1988, I believe from Madison Square Garden. And you just see someone run on stage and start tapping on Eddie's guitar and you don't see that guy get pummeled or thrown off the stage. You just seem like gracefully being taken back. And that person is actually a pre-fame Steve Brown. No kidding. Yeah. I mean, we, we spoke about that in there and he talks about the one time he met Dave. Um, no disrespect to, to Steve. He's a Sammy guy. No disrespect. You can be both. 
Absolutely. <laughs> and just he's one of the nicest people on on Earth. I've interviewed him a few times, met him a few times. Got to love that Steve Brown. Well, let's get to it. And before we do that, we want to say thank you once again for downloading and streaming. Follow us on the Twitter machine at the DLR cast, our fledgling little Twitter <laughs> account. Hit us over there. We're adding a few people all the time. And yeah, we got some good episodes upcoming and hope you're enjoying what we're enjoying. Yeah, thanks for listening. Keep listening. More interviews coming soon and uh, nothing but yeah. <laughs> Now, I tell people all the time, 1978, Kiss Rock and Roll Over and Van Halen won. Those two records completely changed the course of my life, and it's been a course that I've been on. You know, I make the joke all the time. I sold my soul to rock and roll in <laughs> 1978 and never looked back, and I'm cool with it. I'm still running with the devil, if you know what I mean. For sure. Now, there is that video of you hopping on stage at Madison Square Garden during the 5150 tour at all. No, that was OU812. The OU812 tour. My apologies. Yeah. Now, one question that does not get answered in all the comments to that, did you get roughed up after you got pulled off stage? Not at all. Not at all. And that was part of the reason why I did it, because here's the, here's the funny thing. If you watch the video of that full show, Gus, our drummer and trickster, you know, he went, Gus, when he was skinny, he, uh, he jumped up on stage before. We had front row tickets. Our old managers and tricks to the one guy was a ticket scalper, ticket broker. <laughs> so he would always get us the best tickets for the show. So Van Halen, of course, my favorite band. You know, Steve, here, here's an early Christmas present. You're going to go to Van Halen, stand in the front row. And we did. And we were literally, like, standing on the stage, like my foot was on the railing. You know, yeah. we were all. And then during one of the songs, Gus jumps up. And he runs right over Alex's kit and he's banging on the drums and we're cracking up like, oh my God. He gets taken off by Zeke, who is Eddie's tech. He comes running up, grabs him. And next thing you know, like two minutes later, Gus is right back with us. We're like, oh my God, you didn't get the shit beat out of you? He's like, no, man, they just brought me out here. And that was it. And so that got my wheels turning. And I'm like, Eddie, Eddie was literally, you know, four feet away from me at times. And I'm like, this is it. It's now or never. Listen, man, Van Halen wrote the song, might as well jump. So <laughs> I took the initiative. I said, I, there's not going to be a moment in my life that I'm never going to get like this again, not knowing what was going to happen to me years later, becoming friends with Eddie and whatnot. But, you know, for that moment, it was just there. And I waited and it was at the end of rock and roll. And I saw a moment and I just said, fuck it. My buddy, Jim DeSalvo, one of my best friends who's not with us any longer he pushed me pj was there they pushed me up people fell back and uh i got up there i ran right up to eddie i'm like let me play your guitar and he fucking was you saw the video he was cool he let me in and i started doing one of his licks and watching sammy and mike come over i forgot about that whole part and then sammy goes that's a bad mofo because he knew i could play like he could hear it you know i wasn't just some idiot he saw what i was playing i was playing real licks and uh, after the show, my buddy Jim, he kept saying that. He goes, Sammy said, you're one bad mofo. And he was like, that was the greatest thing. And what was funny about that, I had been searching high and low forever for a picture of that or the video. The guy who posted the video years ago, he didn't post the full show. So it wasn't until we did this Izzy Presley thing that – um, what's his name? Um, the bass player for the Atomic Punks. We started talking about it and he was like, he messaged in, dude, it's on YouTube. And we fucked. So I was like, I couldn't believe it. There it is. There it is. Proof to everybody who didn't believe it. You know, and then three years later, I'm sitting in the dressing room with Sammy and Eddie at the Meadowlands Arena on the uh, fuck tour, the 91. And Eddie goes, this is the kid who jumped up on stage at the Garden, you know, on the OU812 tour that played. Because by that time, Trickster had sold a million records and whatnot. And everybody, you know, Eddie and I were friends already. And so he told the story to Sammy. And he was like, he's like, oh, shit, I remember Zeke telling this story. And it's just, you know, finally it's documented. And I couldn't be happier, man. It's just one of those magical nights. I still have the ticket stub from the show, too. Wow. Yeah. Now, were you always a Dave guy and a Sammy guy? Because you just said Van Halen's a favorite band, if not the favorite band. Yeah, I would, Van Halen is, you know, Kiss Van Halen, Def Leppard, of course. You know, they're everything. And, but Van Halen is, Eddie Van Halen is the reason why I do this, why I still do this, you know, here. 
why I'm here and you know one of my biggest supporters oh. you know um there's no everybody knows that and I see the EDH then, strap on the head there too yeah 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 that's my <laughs> little one I'm recording I need to use that sometimes but you know it, yeah Van Halen has always been the band you know Kiss was my first introduction you know my first concert 1979 Kiss but Van Halen was the band when I saw them in 1982 on the Diver Down tour. That was the moment that I was like, this is the kind of band that I want. Kiss was so unattainable. When mm -hmm. I saw Van Halen, I was like, this is what I want to do. Because it was like a party. It was a rock show. Mm -hmm. the music, Ed's, Edward's musical, you know, his playing, the volume, David Lee Roth, Michael Anthony, Alex. It was just everything that I wanted a band to be. And that's what, when I started Trickster in 1983, it was basically to, you know, to be a mini Van Halen, you know? And so, yeah, that, that was the be all end all. But the Sam and Dave thing, I mean, look, uh, of course, the early Van Halen is near and dear to me, but I love, you know, the Sammy era. I love 5150. I love it all. You know, I really can't, you know, and for me, you know, part of the Sammy era is very important because that's when I met Edward for the first time and became friends with all those guys, man. I, you know, go to Eddie's house and fucking go to rehearsals. So I was friends with all them. Sammy was great to me. Michael, Alex, you know, I mean, it was crazy. You know, as a little kid, you know, <laughs> and again, people ask me this all the time. Did you ever think that you'd be playing with Def Leppard? Did you ever think that you'd tour with Kiss? Did you ever think that you'd hang out with Eddie Van Halen? You know, uh, when I was eight years old, when I was 12 years old, probably never in a million years would I dream of it. But as life goes on, that's what it is. You know, yep. you you work yourself. I worked my ass off and still work my ass still off do. For, these, for these opportunities. And yep. I'm, these guys, these guys aren't, you know, as much as they're my idols and stuff, they're my friends. You know, when I see Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley backstage, they don't treat me like a fan and I don't treat them like good. They're my friends. I'm friends with these guys. Eddie Van Halen, we do, you know, it's the same thing. And, you know, going, you know, Phil Collin is like family to me as the Def Leppard guys are. So, you know, but as a little kid, you know, wow, would I, you know, when I held up the Pyromania record, could I ever have imagined that I'd be on stage playing photograph with them? I mean, it, it's mind blowing. It really is. And again, right. it goes back to what I said before. You're you're all looking at one of the luckiest guys in the world, you know. But it wasn't it wasn't without twenty thousand hours of work and right. and, the, and and putting in the work and being being legitimate, being the real deal. And that's uh, certainly what I am. And are you a fan of Sonrisa Salvaje? What is that? That's uh, Eat Him and Smile recorded in Spanish by D.L. Uh, you know what, man? Not not, not so much. I mean. I don't, I don't have it. I do love Eat em and Smile. It's at, well, Skyscraper's actually right over there. But no, I, I've heard it, you know. But yeah, they, I'm not really a big fan of that. Um, and nothing against, I love Spanish food. I love Spanish people. I love everybody. So, you know, I, I know we're in very sensitive times right now. So no disrespect to the Latino community. I wasn't good in Spanish. You know, <laughs> uno, dos, tres, cuatro. That's as far as I got. But, uh, you know, I love me some paella. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, no, man, I'm just a huge fan of the Eat 'Em and Smile record. I mean, again, you know, Eat 'Em and Smile, 5150. I love both those records equally, you know, and so there's all love there. I love all things Van Halen, you know, and I'm still, you know, look, man, Dave has been rough over the last couple of years and kind of how his ship has kind of sunk a little bit, you know, seeing that he's now an opening act for Van Halen. I mean, for, for Kiss, for Kiss yeah. and, you know, but I got to give him credit, man. Dave is just one of these guys who just, it's what, this is what he does. And I think Dave, you know, and I've opened for Dave with 40 foot Ringo. We did some shows with him and the guy, this is what he does. And I don't think he gives a shit. I don't think he has anything to prove to anybody. And we can all rip on him. Look, man, we all know he doesn't sing like he used to. He never really was the greatest singer live, you know, and even in the studio, all those vocal lines that he did were fed to him pretty much by Ted Templeman anyway, you know, so you, it is what it is. But to me, back in the 80s, David Lee Roth was the greatest frontman, barn, and anybody who was there and saw him, he was the greatest there ever was at that for, the, 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 for that short period of time. Well, then two quick questions, and then you're a free man, or at least you're doing more press after this. Oh, I'm a free man. Okay. <laughs> First one, have you ever seen the Dave concert 
uh, live from Finland, 99. It's an MTV thing on YouTube. Yeah, with Bart, well, the late Bart Walsh playing guitar, and Bart was a cool guy, so God rest his soul. But yes, I did. And top notch, him in top singing form, uh, I must say. A lot of people get on him that he was never the greatest singer alive, but he totally had it going in the late 90s. Yeah, well, I think it was out of necessity. And I think Dave, you know, I, he, gets, he, he gets a lot of slack on this last run that he was doing because I got to see him when they played in Allentown right at the beginning of February. Greg Smith and I went out to the show. And I thought, he, I thought he, he, you could tell he's putting in a lot of work sure. to really try to do his best. And, um, you know, what can I say? I mean, look, man. Dave, you know, there's a great story. It's been documented, but the first, when we were recording the first Tricks record, the first week we got out to California, we were at this famous club Bordello and they had a big Thursday night thing where everybody was hanging and we were there. And man, I remember it like yesterday, we're standing there and somebody knocks, you know, one of the guys said to me, dude, there's David Lee Roth. And there he was, man, the fucking guy that we all in Trickster, I mean, Van Halen was what we modeled ourselves after. There he was. He was in all leather. And we went up to him and introduced ourselves. He was so fucking nice to us. I know also he gets a bad rap, but he was so nice. We told him we could just got a record deal. We'll out, we're out here making our first record. And I told him, I said, it's because of you and Ed that we're here and that we're get. we got this opportunity. And he just said to me, he shook my hand. He said, well, good luck to you, Steve. And I'll never forget that, man. And, and so whatever anybody wants to say, and hey, I'm guilty of it too, man. You know, look, I, I'm a little, I, I get a little tired of seeing a lot of these old rock stars, especially singers who can't measure up and they're fucking lazy and they don't do vocal exercises. Guys don't warm up. There's no excuse, man. Especially when you got McCartney out there at 78 years old, still yeah, kicking ass. Yeah. Mick Jagger. I mean, did you hear the last, the new stones fucking song? It's awesome. Great song. Guys, great video. Yeah. They're fucking 78 years old and they're still wow. killing it. So when I hear guys in their sixties that are complaining about their voice, Fuck, shut the fuck up. Get out there, work harder, man. Like Phil Collins told me, man, you know, and Def Leppard was a great, you know, motivator for me, especially over the last couple of years, getting in shape, being in the best shape of my life. I'm going to be 50 in two weeks, man. And I'm in better shape now than I was when I was 21 years old. So, and that, a lot of that goes to Phil Collins and Def Leppard. But he always told me, he said, the older you get, you got to work harder. And I believe that. And guys like Phil Collins, even Joe Elliott, Joe Elliott, 61 years old, guys fucking singing better than he ever has. And, you know, it's just one of those things, man. You got to put the work in no matter what age. So, you know, there you go. So Roth, I think he was really, if this tour would have kept going, I think by this time he would have been in top form. 